Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, this is a COVID-19 update um, I was asked to create for Bison Ambulance Service in Bison, South Dakota. And just wanted to kind of give you guys an update on some things that you need to do and uh, just kind of explain a few things. So first and foremost, what is COVID-19? So COVID-19 falls under the SARS category of it being a severe acute respiratory syndrome, also known as SARS-CoV-2, previously known by the provisional name of 2019 novel coronavirus. Um, it's a virus. It's uh, thought to have started in China and the Hunan province, and it's spread globally. It is a pandemic. So what are the symptoms? The uh, primary symptoms that uh, most patients experience or is going to be uh, cough, fever, and shortness of breath. However, um, patients can also um, present with, with some other f symptoms such as fever, fatigue, uh, decreased kidney functions, uh, diarrhea. Uh, the respiratory thing can include sneezing, runny nose, sore throat, dry cough, and shortness of breath. Uh, the circulatory system, we can see decreased white blood counts. Uh, we did see that with a patient here recently that was confirmed as a COVID-19 patient. Patient came in basically with um, not feeling well, diarrhea, and when he came in, he was very short of breath and had a high fever and was confirmed to be COVID-19. This patient ended up being uh, placed on a ventilator. So the main thing is, guys and gals, is this is a very, very serious illness. Um, a lot of these, some, some can be very, very mild. Uh, mild symptoms, these patients can stay at home and they don't require hospitalization. But if they get to the point that they require hospitalization, they're going to need uh, aggressive respiratory support. So who is most at risk? Of course, it's kind of the same thing that we hear when we're, we're talking about other disease processes. Older people. Uh, people with lung disease such as COPD, congestive heart failure, asthma, those kind of things, cardiovascular disease, which includes hypertension, diabetes, and compromised immune systems. So folks that may have cancer, AIDS, HIV, or other immunocompromised stuff are going to be most at risk. So believe it or not, the call actually begins with dispatch. We need to use that to our advantage, guys and gals. So you need to get a plan together down there. And I, I advise, you know, Will or whoever is to get with your dispatch and make sure that they're doing pre-screening prior to you actually going to the call and make a card for the dispatcher to ask those questions. Are, do, you think, do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? Are you short of breath? Have you recently traveled? All of those questions that may be able to line us up and to start thinking about, is it possible for this patient to have COVID-19? Is the scene safe? And so when we have uh, calls that have any kind of respiratory stuff or just general illness stuff, we should assume that they have COVID-19 until ruled otherwise, and we should definitely make sure that we are protecting ourselves with the proper PPE. So one of the things that I would consider doing is just sending one person in. And so they can do a really quick initial assessment to see what's going on. Um, so ask the following, and they should do that with a distance of six feet away from the patient and ask the following. Do you have a fever or do you feel like you have a fever? Have you had a cough or a sore throat? Are you short of breath? Have you been in contact with anyone who's been ill? Any recent travel? If they answer yes to those questions, or even one of those questions, we should be highly suspicious this patient could have COVID-19, and everybody else should, should come in with all of their gear on. Um, the person who does go in and do the initial assessment should have all of their personal protective equipment on. So speaking of, the minimum required PPE that we should be using includes gloves, gown, an N95 respirator, Eye protection, which can include safety glasses, face shield, goggles, anything. Your normal reading glasses or your normal glasses that you wear every day it does not count as PPE. So everybody knows that um, there is quite a shortage of PPE around the nation. Um, so you have to think outside of the box a little bit on this. Is you have to look at hardware. Ask, look at your hardware stores. They do have some items that you may be able to use. Believe it or not, the one here in Langdon where I work, um, we were able to grab N95 masks from there. Um, we were able to get um, the uh, surgical masks from there. 
dust masks were there, and also there was quite a bit of eye protection that we could have. A lot of these stuff that can be found in the hardware stores, many of your industries that are in town, the agriculture industry, may have some of this equipment. Ask them. See if they will donate it to you. Eye protection can be decontaminated and reused, so wipe it down with your normal kill time and um, wash it off, get it clean again, and you can reuse that. You can reuse a N95 respirator. I'm going to send you guys a video on how to, to reuse N95 respirator, how to keep it clean and all that, and I will send that out to you pretty shortly. One of the things that you may be able to consider is having a washable gown. Um, so you may want to get some of your sewing friends together and ask about that. But it, if they we're going to have splashes and that kind of stuff, you can't wear a washable gown because that that fluid is going to soak through it. So you may have to consider wearing under that or over that as something like a garbage bag, for an example, to keep those splashes off of you. It's kind of sad that we're having to do this, but we're having to think outside of the box. Once we get with the patient, place a surgical mask over the patient. This can be one of those little the paper surgical mask or a dust mask, either one. If we have to use oxygen, we're going to place the device on the patient, whether it's a nasal cannula or a non-rebreather, and then that mask over the top of that device. Perform your full assessment and workup as you normally would, but I want you to be utilizing high caution when using airway procedures is because it could aerosolize. We're going to talk about that in a second. The ventilator fan. You should have a ventilator switch in the back of that ambulance or a vent fan or also known as the exhaust fan. They have different names. You want to turn that exhaust ventilator fan on, leave it on the entire time that the patient is in the vehicle. And you want to keep that on all the way until you get back to the station. It's going to give you a nice air exchange inside the back of that ambulance. We want to make sure that we contact the hospital early and advise of suspected COVID-19. That's going to give them a chance to get their procedures ready and for them to don their personal protective equipment. So aerosolization, one of the big things that we're going to be doing, especially for you guys on the ambulance here in Bison, is giving a uh, nebulizer treatment. And we should be, like, we only should be doing that if absolutely necessary. And if we are doing that, it should be done with extreme caution. As the reason is, you can see in the picture there, is that every time this guy breathes out is because COVID-19 is droplet transmitted, right? So he's actually putting out lots of droplets when he's breathing out with this breathing treatment. So let's be very cautious when we're doing aerosolization, uh, giving breathing treatments, putting in airways, that kind of stuff. One of the things that I highly suggest is to keep the compartment separate as having a clean cab. Preferably if the driver does not have to participate in patient care activities, that driver should stay in the vehicle and um, stay up front, don't get out, don't have anything to do with the back, even at the hospital, is to stay in the front, don't even get out help with a stretch or anything, let's keep a clean cab if we can. But if we do have to get up front and drive or whatever, every surface that is inside of the front of that vehicle has to be decontaminated just like you do in the back. So where to decontaminate? You decontaminate wherever you drop that patient off at. If you drop them off at your local hospital, that's exactly where you decontaminate at. And even if it takes you an hour to get this done, that's perfectly acceptable. Is because what they have to understand at the hospital is, is that that is your ride back to where you go. And you have to have a clean environment to ride back in to be safe. So decontaminate there, anything that touched the patient, any items that you use or anything that needs to be disposed of, you dispose of it there. Don't take it back with you, including laundry and all of that stuff. Leave it at the hospital. So how to decontaminate? Um, there is a procedure that we need to follow when it comes to decontaminating the ambulance. So the first thing is, is a lot of times when you're in the hospital, they're probably going to ask you to take off your PPE in the patient's room before exiting back out of the hallway. Um, every hospital is different, so I would add, get with um, West River Health Services and kind of find out what their procedures are with that. Don your PPE. Make sure that you're, you put PPE back on. Remove all the linen off the stretcher. Uh, make sure that you, I would go ahead right now, and if you've got one of those covers that kind of stays on the stretcher, you know, keeps the patient warm, go ahead and take that thing off. 
just keep a sheet and a blanket and the things that you're going to need to keep the patient warm. You don't have to have a bunch of stuff and more laundry. You don't want to be taking any kind of laundry back with you back to the ambulance garage. You want to leave all of that stuff at the hospital. So the less laundry you have on there, the better. Um, and follow their procedures for laundry. Every place is a little bit different. Any garbage that was used on there and everything goes in a red bag and is disposed in the red barrel at the hospital. All surfaces need to be wiped down with the purple wipes that you guys have. And it takes between two to three minutes because it has to actually sit on the surface. All right. And that includes everything. And then you can go ahead and clean on top of that. And that means everything. Everything in that ambulance, in the back of it, all the doors, the door jams, everything, every surface of that stretcher, even the ceiling. And one of the things that I would absolutely get you guys to do is put everything that you can inside of cabinets that can be closed. Uh, don't leave a bunch of stuff out, um, like bags or having a bunch of equipment that's laying out um, on the sides or whatever. Everything that, that, that's going to be out in the open is going to have to be clean. So if you can get away with taking some of the stuff that we normally have that's kind of convenient, like radios and all this stuff, is put them somewhere else behind a cabinet and that way we don't have to clean as much is because everything that's out there where that patient is, this entire area in that cabinet, everything has to be wiped down and clean. Everything. And I mean everything. Every last surface has to be wiped down. And if, you, if your driver was exposed to that patient or anything like that, make sure we're decontaminating the front of that ambulance. And don't forget that on the way back home, keep that vent fan on. Keep an exposure log. So keep a, an ex, a log of everybody who was, expect, was exposed to that patient, the time that they were exposed, the length of exposure, and keep that on there. Um, this is gonna be important because if that patient is COVID-19, this is gonna be very, very helpful in determining things like about quarantine, um, as far as, um, the medical surveillance, all of these things that may have to, have to happen later on down the line, but have that good documentation. And speaking of, document, document, document. Document every single finding that you find, especially their, their history, um, especially the recent travel history, their cough, cold, all their respiratory symptoms, and write down specifically in your documentation who was on the call what PPE was used, what decontamination method. This is gonna be very, very important later on down the line. So guys and gals, if you have any questions about COVID-19, your response on the ambulance or anything that I can do to kind of help you out, please um, email me at medicforoil at yahoo.com or you can always text me or give me a phone call 701-340-4925. So, Thanks so much for listening, and if you have any comments, concerns, or anything like that, I'm here to help you out. Thanks so much, guys.